when I worked for Jurassic Park, I worked on the Tyrannosaurus segment first, and I thought they just wanted anatomy and range of motion and that sort of thing, body proportions. For the second segment, the Velociraptor segment that I worked on, they wanted more of a character. Well, I did one drawing of a, a Velociraptor that is very evil looking, and it took some very subtle tweaks of soft tissue around the eyes and so forth to get that look. And it wasn't very difficult for me because I'd always pictured velociraptors as these uh, nasty, smelly chickens with switchblades. It uh, <laughs> wasn't too far from that to depict them with a hint of evil. Oh, definitely. Like the way they are portrayed in the novel, they're pretty villainous creatures in Crichton's book, for sure. Well, they are sort of in a biological way. I mean... The movies took it a step further because they tried to give them an evil look, which really is kind of silly. We're just humans imposing our sort of frivolous ideas on these actual biological creatures <laughs> uh, 90 million years after the fact. I mean, it's kind of silly in a way, but I think that the book is pretty good about depicting them as very cunning, sort of, and, you know, they're smart and they are definitely predators. But the superimposition of a little evil on that, it, it's kind of a silly touch, but if it makes it more possible, more doable in a movie, then so be it. Kind of like when the raptor's lip curls in the kitchen scene right before it attacks the kids. I always questioned the accuracy of that moment. Yeah. Now, the Tyrannosaurus Rex in the film had two distinctive structures in its head from the nose to the top of the eyes, resembling a distinctive brow. The raptors had a similar structure. A lot of paleo art incorporated that look after the film. Was this your idea, or did it come from elsewhere? No, I don't think it was my idea. I may have heightened it a little bit. When you look at a Tyrannosaurus skull, it has these sort of uh, rugose bumps in that area. You know, it's all above the eye. It starts just in front of the eye and it's over the eye. And so my interpretation of that was that there were some bigger scales there. But I don't think I was the originator of that idea. I think other people had done that before me. I'm not sure who. But maybe it will be reinterpreted in some other way in the future, you know? Yeah, paleontology constantly evolves, of course. So you've read the novel. What were your thoughts on it? My thoughts on it weren't 100% positive, to, to tell you. <laughs> um, I, I loved the dinosaurs, of course. And I loved the fast pace of the plot, but the humans were somewhat disappointing because I think Michael Crichton, for some reason, he has a problem with writing characters with any depth to them. Uh, so the humans, to me, were sort of like cardboard cutouts, really. Yeah, I've read a lot of his novels, and the characters were usually his weakest points. The science, of course, he always nailed, but the characters were actually an aspect of the film that certainly improved in comparison. They're a, a bit more invested in the story. I think that's right, and I think the characters in the movie are good, and they have good and understandable motivations and that sort of thing. Did you have any input for the human characters of the film? I, I didn't have input into the human characters. I had some input into the plot ideas, because they were still kind of you know, cobbling this thing together in 1990 when I was working. I saw a number of things, a number of ideas of mine die on the set um, <laughs> because they, cause they didn't work out the way they wanted them to. There's a scene where there's a velociraptor or two that, that are stalking the humans, and there's a scene where it, there's a hanging sheet of polyethylene, and one of them sticks its snout under the bottom of it and lifts it up and comes through. Well, that had an evolution, and that's one of my ideas that I saw die on the set was a, was a precursor to that. So I made a drawing for them of a velociraptor on the outside of the visitor center, and the power is out, and it's dark. It's putting its hands on the, the glass of the window in the door, and it's also kind of foggy and steamy. And that evolved into several things, but one of the things it evolved into was having the same sort of thing, but having the velociraptor be on the other side of a sheet of polyethylene, and then its claws rip through the polyethylene and shred it, and then it comes through. In one model, they had little razors inserted into the claws so it could do that. 
but it just wasn't working when it was filmed. It was just not coming off the way they wanted it to, so they ended up just nosing under the thing instead of ripping it. So that's one little little example of of a thing. Here's another thing that, that I had some input to. I was accidentally responsible for the least scientific anatomical <laughs> detail of the dinosaurs, and here's the way it, it happened. Rick Carter called me, I think it was a Friday afternoon, and he said, okay, I'm working on a plot segment here, and I'm wondering how to resolve this. Let's say some people are backed into a corner by one of these carnivorous dinosaurs. I think he mentioned specifically the Dilophosaurus, became the spitters. He has these humans backed into a corner, and then the paleontologist Grant, by virtue of something he knows as a paleontologist that the others don't get, he somehow gets them out of that situation. And so I said, okay, what if there are predatory dinosaurs, maybe dilophosaurs, that have some inflatable structure? And I was actually thinking of an inflatable balloon on the nose or snout area, but I said some inflatable structure. And let's say we've seen two of these facing off, two males, let's say, and one of them inflates the, the structure and the other one is intimidated and runs away. Okay, so then fast forward to the humans back into the corner by the same critter. Let's say this inflatable something or other is red and black striped. This dinosaur has backed them into a corner and Grant sees a red and black striped umbrella in the corner and grabs it, opens it, and it scares the dinosaur off at least enough for them to get away. So I thought that was a great sort of Spielbergian touch. By the time I got out there to watch some of the filming, that part of the plot had been cast aside, but the anatomy was still there. The Tylophosaur had this thing that looked a little bit like a um, opening umbrella, the frill around its neck. So, so that's just a little tale of how that detail got in there and how the anatomy it out survived that plot element. Yeah, I was definitely curious about that detail. I had read about your involvement in that elsewhere, but had wanted to know more. I loved your idea of the spitter umbrella, by the way. I thought it was really cool and amusing, even. In the storyboards, it is done a little differently, but very similar. The kids use it instead of Grant. Such a clever idea and fantastic that it came from you. Regardless of the scene being omitted, I am kind of shocked they never made an actual real spitter umbrella that people could really buy. It seemed like kind of a missed opportunity for a product. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That would have that would have been a million seller. <laughs> Be sure to watch the complete interview, The Vision of John Gurchie, right here at Jurassic Time.